Welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I am going to be reading chapter 11 from my granddad's book, Around the Horn, by Frank Downs. Chapter 11 includes Return to Professional Horn Playing, Sadler's Wells, Fontaine, Shearer, Gray, Turner, Helpman, Ashton, Hugo Rignold. My return to professional horn playing began when I was offered a contract to play in the orchestra of Sadler's Wells Ballet, who were about to commence a tour of the provinces. Margot Fontaine, Moira Shearer and Beryl Gray, Michael Soames, Harold Turner, Robert Helpman and Frederick Ashton were principal dancers. An exciting prospect and particularly so as I had previously had little experience of the ballet repertoire. As our first baby was due sometime during the tour, it was arranged that a deputy would take over when the time came. After initial performances at Covent Garden, the tour began. It was to take us to Coventry, Leeds, Newcastle-on-Tyne, Glasgow and Aberdeen. Playing in a theatre's orchestral pit with lights dimmed and barely enough light on one's music stand was at first disturbing. The acoustics too differed in the various theatres and seeing the conductor's beat was sometimes a trial. Nevertheless it was a rewarding experience as one became acclimatised to the environment. I saw little of the dancing on the stage for the first few days being far too engrossed in playing the notes. Later on, however, as I became more familiar with the score and providing I was in a favourable position to see part of the stage, it was possible occasionally to see some wonderful moments of ballet. The repertoire was wide and varied. Carnival by Schumann, Les Patineurs by Meyerbeer, Les Sylphides by Chopin, Hamlet and Swan Lake, Tchaikovsky, Variations, César Franck, Paris, Delius, Miracle in the Gorbals and Checkmate by Bliss, and also The Rake's Progress by Gavin Gordon. Mornings were usually free apart from Mondays which were reserved for any extra rehearsals. The theatre was the only place where one could practice, so that I spent most of my time there using any available dressing room to study. I was very glad to be able to do so, as from an early age I had felt an urge to practice each day, be it horn or piano, I was very impressed by the dedication of the young dancers in the company. Every morning when I arrived they would be hard at work, rehearsing their routine on the stage. The physical strain involved seemed almost unbearable. I made many friends in the orchestra, the closest being Hugo Rignold, who on this tour was principal viola and deputy conductor. I knew him previously as a very fine and experienced player, but as yet knew little of his conducting. During the tour I was to learn how incredibly gifted he was. We were at the Grand Theatre Leeds performing Miracle in the Gorbals on this particular evening. Shortly before the curtain was due to go up, the regular conductor fell ill and Hugo was called upon to conduct. He was quite brilliant, perfectly assured throughout, and the whole orchestra and dancers were obviously very impressed. He later conducted several matinee performances of other ballets with the same sensitivity and natural musical ability. A few days after the end of the tour in late August, I received a telegram from Liverpool in response to my application for a vacancy in the horn section of the Philharmonic Orchestra. It was an exciting but challenging prospect. The horn section at that time had a high reputation. The possibility of sitting next to one of the country's great players, Edmund Chapman, was indeed thrilling. Dr Malcolm Sargent was and had been the musical director and conductor since the orchestra was formed during the war years. Together with the principal horn John Johnson, he greeted me as I entered the green room of the Philharmonic Hall. I was terribly nervous and the adrenaline was pumping away. Contrary to expectations, owing to them having put me at ease, I began to play the Beethoven horn sonata confidently. Dr Sargent played the difficult piano parts of both the sonata and my second piece, a 20th century work by the French composer Jean Clergue. 
Sight reading was tough. Stravinsky, Brahms, Richard Strauss, Wagner's Siegfried Idyll and the whole of the Mendelssohn Nocturne. After a brief spell sitting in the corridor outside, I was recalled to be told that I was offered the post. Overjoyed, I was then taken by John Johnson to the administration offices and then to meet the general manager, Wing Commander Beard. However, before we arrived there, the most extraordinary thing happened. Along the corridor, obviously awaiting my arrival, were Edmund Chapman, Eddie to colleagues, and Bill Waller. Together with John Johnson, they ushered me into a side room. After a brief welcome, Eddie began. Now, the wing commander will offer you £12 per week. You must refuse this. £15 is the rate for this position you are taking. You must not accept less. I was completely taken aback. All kinds of fears flashed through my mind. What if the manager was adamant? I wanted the job. If I accepted £12, what would my colleagues think? I went into the office. The wing commander, a smart, thick-set, handsome man with grey hair, greeted me with a smile. Ah, good morning, Mr Downs, he said. Do take a seat. I see you are in the RAF. He must have spotted my Air Force blue shirt. Commissioned, of course. No, I said promptly. Just a leading aircraftsman. He looked down at his desk. Oh, he said. Anyway, welcome to the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. We hope you will be happy here. He paused for a moment and then went on. Now we can offer you £12 a week and I have the contract here for you to sign. Eddie and his colleagues were correct. Summoning up my courage, I practically forced myself to refuse that offer. I am sorry, Mr Beard. I cannot accept that figure. I could not accept less than £15. My heart was thumping away. He got up and walked around the room. Then he turned to me, shook hands and said, £15 it is. As I was about to leave, he turned to me again. By the way, have you met Mr Chapman yet? Yes, I said as I went out. I met him on the way here. At the end of the corridor, my three colleagues awaited me. We retired across the road to the local Philharmonic pub. Some weeks later, Mr Beard left Liverpool and was succeeded by his deputy, Wilfred Stiff. Before leaving this episode, however, it is, I think, worth recording an amusing anecdote. Mr Beard, when booking engagements at the Civic Hall, Wolverhampton, had to correspond with the manager of that fine hall. His name, Mr Whiskers. End of chapter 11 To end this podcast episode, I am going to play Folk Dance from Andrew Downs' Suite No. 1 for Brass Quintet, performed by Senate Brass. This work was dedicated to the memory of Bernard Brown, commissioned by the Cambrian Brass Quintet. The work was first performed at the Bernard Brown Memorial Concert in Birmingham Cathedral in November 1983. Numerous subsequent performances by Cambrian Brass include ones at the Royal Festival Hall and the Barbican Centre, both in London, the Recital Hall of the Birmingham School of Music, the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, the London College of Music, Birmingham Cathedral and several music societies around the UK. These performances reflect the tour that my granddad did with Sadler's Wells Ballet and the music is perfect for dancing to. This is Senate Brass who recorded this work for Andrew Down's 70th birthday year in 2020. Thank you.